Hello, my name is Stephen Salloway, and I am a professor of neurology and psychiatry at the Albert Medical School of Brown University. And I want to thank One Day University for inviting me to speak to you today about the important topic of Alzheimer's and dementia, what we know now. Here are my disclosures. I will be talking about drugs and diagnostic tests and development that I've been involved in helping to develop. And I also consult with a number of companies involved with developing uh, these new advances. There have been some major advances in the fight against Alzheimer's disease. And I just wanna highlight a few of them and I'll be talking about them in the remainder of this lecture. There is a now a national plan to fight Alzheimer's enacted by Congress that now has brought about increased funding from the NIH for research into Alzheimer's disease. There have been wonderful public-private partnerships that have created cohorts where we can study people who may be at risk for Alzheimer's to determine the best way to detect that risk. And these have occurred around the world and have been amazingly productive. We now have uh, brain scans that can safely see the plaques and the tangles, the main pathology of Alzheimer's in the brain well before memory loss. And we have medications that actually can lower the buildup of these abnormal and toxic proteins. As a result, we've opened the era of Alzheimer's prevention, which is fantastic where we may be able to actually delay or prevent Alzheimer's disease, which we all want. And very encouraging is we have new blood tests to detect some of these same changes and risk that are gonna be much more economical and easier to use. And all kinds of drugs are in development that will bring new innovation to this field. Now on a personal note, um, People ask me, how did I get involved in Alzheimer's research? Well, my family was very supportive of a career in medicine, which I thank them for. And unfortunately, my grandmother, who you see pictured on the right side of this slide, uh, had dementia. Uh, she lived with us um, for a period of time in my room because that was the only extra bed. And I got to see really what the impact was on her and our whole family over many years, she had a very slowly progressive form of dementia, and I saw all the stages and how impactful that was for her and for all of us. And that really sensitized me to this area that as I considered a career in medicine and in wanting to fight uh, a brain disease, uh, Alzheimer's rose to the top because of the urgent unmet need. And I know my experience in my own family has really made me uh, more aware and a much better physician and researcher. Now, Alzheimer's is really a major league problem. It's one of our top public health problems that doesn't yet have a solution. Age is the biggest risk factor for Alzheimer's with the rate doubling every five years after the age of 65. So people 85 and older, which is a very fast growing segment of the population, 30 to 50% of them will develop Alzheimer's. And that makes it confusing because people often say they, don't, they equate aging with Alzheimer's. Well, while it's common, it is a pathological form of aging. It's not a normal part of aging, but it's very common and it's easy to conflate the two. And the cost of care is already greater than that for cancer and for heart disease. And that's only gonna grow as the, the number of people, not the aging population expands. Now, fortunately, there's been a growth, an exponential growth really in funding for Alzheimer's research from the NIH. And you can see it was relatively flat for a number of years. And now it has expanded more than five or six fold to over $3 billion per year, which is terrific. And it's really um, stimulating innovation. However, we still lag behind other major diseases such as heart disease 
and cancer were actually on par with HIV. And if you think about how staggering the impact of Alzheimer's and the cost is, we've got to do better. Now, what happens in the brain with Alzheimer's disease? Well, this is Dr. Alzheimer pictured in the upper left and his first patient, August D. He, uh, she was 51 years old when she developed memory loss and a change in behavior. And he followed her for the next four years till she passed away and then examined her brain. And these are the pictures that he drew from his inspection under the microscope. And on the upper left, you see the plaques which turn out to be made of amyloid protein. He didn't know that at the time. Um, and then that are in between the nerve cells. And in the middle are the tangles that are inside the nerve cells, another clump of protein made up of tau protein, which we discovered more recently, which are the hallmarks in Alzheimer's. So these, the plaques begin accumulating 15 to 20 years before the memory loss. And the tangles come closer to the time of memory loss. When proteins build up in the brain in these aggregates, in these clumps, it causes uh, an immune reaction. Part of it is to clear the debris, which is uh, helpful for the brain, but the other part can stimulate a toxic response, which actually makes the whole process of neurodegeneration worse. So inflammation is an important component of the Alzheimer's disease changes in the brain. And what eventually happens is that the connections between nerve cells, the synapses begin to break down and over time the nerve cells degenerate. And you can see in the picture of a brain on the lower right, is someone with Alzheimer's disease has a much smaller brain because of this neurodegeneration. So all these components, the amyloid accumulation, the tau buildup, the neuroinflammation are targets for therapy, but there are many others, because I said, Aging is the biggest risk factor for Alzheimer's. So what's going on in the brain as neurons age? How can we understand that and promote their vitality? What happens to energy metabolism? What happens to clearance of proteins? And what happens to program changes within the cell with aging? These are all potential targets to promote vitality of nerve cells as we age. Now, another important component is changes in blood vessels in the brain. So there is clearly a vascular contribution to dementia, to cognitive impairment, and to Alzheimer's, which is actually Dr. Alzheimer also described. Um, and what tends to happen is if you have narrowing of small blood vessels called arterial sclerosis, if you have small little strokes or little lacunar infarcts, or even micro infarcts, which we can't even see very well on the MRI, these all contribute to cognitive impairment, especially if someone also has amyloid plaques and tau tangles as well. So the vascular component is very important to brain health and also another target for keeping, for promoting brain health, and which I'll talk about later. So what happens in the brain as we age? So these are MRI scans from uh, on the left side, upper left, a person 30 years old. The white area in the middle is cerebral spinal fluid or water, which we all have in the brain. And that water space is relatively narrow. Here's a normal 65 year old on the upper right who is, has no cognitive difficulty, but you can see the water space has expanded a little bit. The water space, the white areas on the edge of the brain are a little more prominent because the brain gets a little bit smaller as we age. This is part of normal aging. In the lower two panels, you can see someone, a 65 year old with mild dementia due to Alzheimer's disease. And there in the middle, those white spaces are further expanded and the size of the brain on the surface is smaller. And that same person five years later, you can see that this whole process of brain atrophy or shrinkage is more pronounced and the water spaces fill in for the places where the brain substance is lost and the brain itself gets substantially smaller. So it's pathological aging and Alzheimer's disease. 
Now, a big advance is being able to safely see the plaques and the tangles of Alzheimer's disease. Prior to this, we had to wait till someone uh, passed away and an autopsy, we could stain for plaques and tangles and confirm uh, or rule out Alzheimer's disease, but the person had already passed away at that point. But now we can safely see those plaques many years, even before the memory loss. And this is really a great advance and it's uh, safe to do. We actually have three tracers for amyloid that are approved by the FDA. They're not yet covered by insurance, so we haven't been able to, we use them in research, but haven't been able to use them yet in clinical practice, but hopefully that will change in the very near future. And in studying people who have a genetic form of Alzheimer's, where we know the predicted age of onset with almost 100% accuracy, uh, we can determine what changes occur first in the brain. And I wanna really thank those families for making this contribution. We work very closely with them and they have a very a difficult form of Alzheimer's disease, but they've contributed a lot to our understanding of what's happening in the brain. So as a result of those studies, we know that the amyloid plaques build up 15 to 20 years before the memory loss. And closer to the time we start of memory loss, we start to see changes in metabolism in the brain buildup of tau proteins on a PET scan and the beginning of some atrophy or decrease in brain volume. And then sometime later, we actually see the memory loss and the decline in daily functioning. So this gives us an opportunity to intervene early during this long silent period where changes are happening in the brain, the person is at risk for memory loss, but they are still functioning normally. So how do we differentiate cognitive changes of aging from a progressive cognitive disorder like Alzheimer's disease? Well, for one thing, people ask, what's the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? Well, Alzheimer's is, uh, is a disease which is the most common cause of dementia. And it's made up of the plaques and the tangles that I just told you about. Dementia is a general term that means that there's memory loss and a decline in daily functioning, but it doesn't tell you the cause. So you could have Alzheimer's is the most common cause, but you could have a stroke, Parkinson's, head injury, heavy alcohol use, HIV, a hundred things can cause dementia, but Alzheimer's happens to be the disease which is the most common cause. People often confuse those two terms. Now, as we get older, all of us experience some cognitive changes and not for the better usually. And the biggest problem is finding uh, names and words right when we want them. Learning new information becomes less efficient. We can still do it. Multitasking is also less reliable and slower. We tend to misplace items from time to time and our reaction time to things uh, both cognitively and motorically slows down a little bit. The good news is, even though this is so common and it worries all of us, that's my Alzheimer moment, my senior moment, I'm getting Alzheimer's, whatever we say to ourselves, people who are experiencing these age-related changes can still learn and retain information, but it's less efficient. What's more concerning that there may be an underlying cognitive disorder as is the symptoms are occurring more frequently the same symptoms, but they're starting to interfere. The person becomes repetitive. They don't remember what they just said. They don't come up with the names of the words later, not just in the moment, but it doesn't come to them. They don't recall whole events from the day before, not just details of what happened. And they may not recognize that they have a memory problem. Other people around them in their family and their friends become aware more than they are. Those are concerning signs that there's an underlying memory problem, which could be Alzheimer's. So we now conceptualize Alzheimer's or cognition with aging as being normal, or what we call age associated memory impairment, mild cognitive impairment, an early stage of memory loss, which is more than normal aging, but the person isn't, doesn't have dementia, they're still functioning well, and then dementia, which means that daily functioning is impacted by the cognitive impairment. 
And where the field is moving of cognitive neurology is being able to stage, as, as we do with many other diseases, is being able to stage the molecular pattern. So, and PET scans gonna, um, are very helpful to do this. Blood tests will soon be very helpful as well. And just to give you an example, if we wanna measure amyloid buildup and tau buildup to know where someone is on risk for Alzheimer's and cognitive impairment, on the far left side is the upper panel is am our amyloid scans, the bottom panel are tau scans, tau PET scans. And that person is cognitively normal, older person, no amyloid buildup and no tau buildup. So the chance of them developing cognitive impairment, they don't have changes consistent with Alzheimer's. The chance of that happening anytime soon is extremely low, years away, if ever. In the middle is someone who is an older person who's cognitively normal, but they already have a lot of amyloid buildup. Remember I told you there's that long silent period and they have the beginning of the tau spread from the memory area out to the lateral part, the side of the brain. That person is still functioning normally, but they have the key signs of Alzheimer's disease. And we now refer to this as preclinical Alzheimer's disease. And so they're at risk of developing cognitive impairment in the near future. The person on the right has extensive amyloid and extensive tau buildup, and they have dementia due to Alzheimer's, and they have advanced pathology in the brain. So increasingly, doctors are gonna be able to stage the level of risk and the level of impairment uh, that's related to Alzheimer's disease, and hopefully target treatments to slow down that process, you either prevent it or slow it if it's already present. So when someone comes in with a cognitive concern, we, in, in a memory clinic, we take the information from the patient and from someone who knows one or more people that know them well. And we want to be able to corroborate information so we get a full picture of what's been going on. We want to know how the symptoms began, what the first symptom was, how much it has progressed. And then we want to know about different types of functioning, cognition, behavior, motor functioning, sleep, what medications they're on, any substance use. We ask about dementia in first degree relatives and parents and in siblings, uh, because there often is a genetic component in addition to the age risk factor. Genetics is the second most common risk factor. So we want to find out about that. And we want to try to assess how they've changed from their baseline ability. What was their level of education? The, uh, the sophistication of their, uh, their work, their hobbies, their social life, and how have they changed from that uh, level of functioning? And we do, we do neurologic and cognitive examinations to determine uh, what may be abnormal. We also look uh, do some blood tests to look for change in thyroid hormone and B12, other routine labs based on their medical history to make sure those are not contributing. And then we'll obtain an MRI scan to look one for evidence of Alzheimer changes, degenerative changes in the brain, but also to look for other things that could be causing memory loss. Is there evidence of stroke or hydrocephalus or a brain tumor or anything like that? And then if needed, we do additional cognitive testing, neuropsychological testing to determine the pattern and the severity of the memory loss. And increasingly, there'll be additional tests to really confirm or rule out Alzheimer's disease. Uh, genetic tests, blood tests, PET scans that uh, I've been mentioning to you. One simple test we do, which actually can be very informative, is asking the, the person to draw a clock and, and put the numbers in and set the time. Usually we use 10 past 11, in this case it was 10 past three, um, to see if it's normal or not or what difficulty the person has. And this seems like a really simple test, but surprisingly, it's one of the first things that changes in uh, dementia or, or in Alzheimer's disease. And one of the first things that is difficult is knowing which is the large hand and the small hand. 
this is something that we learn early in childhood, but it can be lost as connections in the brain start to break down. And eventually, when someone has dementia, like in the middle panel, they have trouble knowing that the two represents a unit of 10, of 10 minutes. And so they'll use, instead of 10 past three, instead of using the two, they'll use the 10 uh, for the long hand. Um, and then on the right side, we see someone with very small numbers that are all scrunched up there toward the top. That's not typical of Alzheimer's disease. That person's having trouble with visual spatial function, with executive function, and that suggests something that may not be Alzheimer's, something like dementia with Lewy bodies, a form of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. There's another test made famous in, 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 in a way by President Trump, who said, I aced this test, uh, called the MOCA test, another 30-point test, uh, which involves remembering five words, drawing a clock, um, doing some language testing, and it's a little bit harder than the, the common test we use called the mini mental state exam. And this can be a very helpful test uh, for screening for cognitive impairment. I mentioned about the MRI scan. Uh, we try to obtain an MRI scan if we can, and we look for signs of neurodegeneration or neurodegenerative disorder like Alzheimer's uh, of brain shrinkage, of expansion of the water spaces in the brain, and especially in the short-term memory area called the hippocampus, which you can see on the left side with the red arrows. That's, our, that's where we process new information and encode it. And that area typically gets smaller earlier in Alzheimer's disease. And we look, those are not specific for Alzheimer's, but we look for those signs. We also look for vascular changes. So here on the left side, here's someone that has all those white areas in the middle are abnormal. That's increased water content. And in an older person, that's usually due to narrowing of small blood vessels or arterial sclerosis. And you can also see on the left side of that picture that there's a little bit of a gray area. That's a small stroke or a lacunar infarct. So that person has a lot of cerebrovascular disease, but they may have Alzheimer changes as well. And the two are often uh, co-occur. On the right side, we see little black dots on this MRI scan. That's leakiness of blood vessels. Those are little blood products that we can see on the MRI. And this pattern is suggestive of amyloid protein in the blood vessels, causing leakiness in those, in those blood vessels. We also look about for the presence of too much water in the brain, it's called hydrocephalus. And here's someone who doesn't have much brain atrophy, but has a, a large expansion of the water spaces in the brain. And this could be contributing to memory loss, gait difficulty, trouble with bladder control, and may be treatable with a shunt, with a drain placed. And so we look for that because that's a re potentially reversible cause of cognitive difficulty. Just to show you an example of how MRI can be helpful, this is a patient of mine, a 70-year-old who was a, a chorus leader, had trouble managing the chorus, keeping all the music organized. And uh, he, had had, he had mild cognitive impairment when we saw him in the clinic. And on his scan, which he had two years prior, his MRI scan, he showed signs of degenerative change like Alzheimer's. The, the short-term memory area was smaller. The, the brain itself had gotten smaller, so I thought he probably had Alzheimer's. But we repeated the MRI scan just to make sure, and it was good that we did, because in addition to those Alzheimer type changes, he had this big white area in the right uh, front of the brain, which is due to a, an aggressive brain tumor, which needed to be resected. So we look for signs both of Alzheimer's or any other causes of memory loss on the MRI scan. You may have heard the most common risk gene for Alzheimer's is called the APOE4 gene. And this can be tested either with a blood test or a cheek swab. It can be done in a clinic or it can actually be done through 23andMe or some other over-the-counter uh, procedure. And this can be helpful. It doesn't mean you have Alzheimer's or you're going to get Alzheimer's, but it tells you more about your risk. 
Um, and people who carry two copies of this gene, we inherit one copy from each parent. If you have two copies of the ApoE4 gene, then you're at very high risk of developing Alzheimer's and it's gonna occur a little bit earlier. If you have no copies, you're, which is the most common genotype, you can still get Alzheimer's if you live long enough, but the chance goes down. And if you actually have an, another copy that's protective, the E2 gene, your chance goes down even further. So this information can be very helpful in determining your risk for developing Alzheimer's. And it may make you eligible for a clinical trial depending on the design of the study. Now I mentioned about blood tests, which are now coming into the clinic. They're in research studies that these I think are gonna be game changers. So we can look, this took us years to, to technically get to the point where we could measure these very small amounts of amyloid and tau protein in the blood. But now there are tests that are very sensitive and specific that can predict whether or not amyloid plaques are building up in the brain. Um, and I'm hopeful that they will become widely available uh, and uh, more economical. They can help with early diagnosis and to confirm the diagnosis. They can also help screen patients to see who might be eligible for treatments, for example, to lower amyloid protein, which will be coming into the clinic. And we can use them for prevention and early intervention studies, and hopefully at some point soon to monitor the response to treatment. So this is a really a big advance that is just about to come into the clinic. Now, a big question all of us are going to need to um, deal with is whether or not we want to learn more about our risk for Alzheimer's as these tests become more widely available. What are the pros and cons? There's no right or wrong here. Some people really want to be proactive and do whatever they can, especially if they've had it in their family, to lower their chance of developing Alzheimer's and find out, you know, their risk. Other people are just the opposite. They, it's too scary. They don't want to deal with it at all. And a lot of us are in the middle. We're trying to sort out what are the pros and cons. Well, on the pro side, it provides important health information about risk for Alzheimer's, which is an important major disease of aging can help plan for the future, and also can help us take advantage of new treatments through the clinic or research, uh, depending on our risk or degree of cognitive difficulty that's already present. Some of the cons might be that people are worried about becoming more anxious, uh, or could this negatively impact their insurance? Uh, might this negatively impact other members of their family? And so you have to weigh uh, both sides of this and help each person. We try to weigh with the uh, individual uh, about the pros and cons so they can make a decision. Now, one of the advantages of making an early diagnosis is uh, often people are still working, they're driving, so they need to make decisions about financial planning. Um, the family needs to get, this is a condition that goes on for months and years. They need to get educated about it um, and make adjustments, get the resources and support they need. And there are treatment options that are currently available and there are new ones that are being developed all the time that may be available either in practice or through research that the person may want to take advantage of. Now, another issue to sort through is does it make sense to participate in a clinical trial for Alzheimer's? Let's say if you're cognitively normal, a prevention trial, or if you're cognitively impaired and have mild cognitive impairment or mild dementia, a treatment trial for people who already have difficulty. There are different types of studies. Some are observational, where we observe people over time and look for changes that are to us so we see if we can predict who's going to have more difficulty and help us tailor our interventions. Some are very low intensity and easy to do. Some last for years and involve multiple procedures. Some, if they're treatment trials, some involve risk, side effects of the medication, uh, discomfort from the procedures, the time involved. So you have to weigh out, you know, what and the risks and the benefits might be and does it make sense? 
Now, what treatments are available for people who have dementia due to Alzheimer's? Well, the treatment options are limited. Uh, despite lots of investigational trials, there are three medicines that we use for mild to moderate dementia uh, called cholinesterase inhibitors that boost a chemical we need for learning and memory called acetylcholine. And there's one drug that blocks another brain chemical uh, called memantine that's approved for moderate to severe dementia. And these have some benefit, but the underlying disease process continues and progresses and people typically become disabled, unfortunately, and die of Alzheimer's disease, despite the use of these medications. So we recommend them, but they don't stop the disease process. Now, you probably heard just last year and a, a new medicine was approved called aducanumab, and I'll talk a little bit about that because it was very controversial and generated a great deal of public interest. The most important thing when you're dealing with memory loss is as a clinician, but for families is really helping the family understand what's going on so they can learn how to manage it and creating a very predictable routine at home that is very supportive both for the patient and for the family is uh, critical. Um, trying to keep things calm and avoiding arguing that can be challenging sometimes. Assessing safety needs, especially driving safety, which I'll talk to you about next is really important. So one of the problems with dementia is that it increases the, and as it gets worse, the chance of an accident or getting lost increases. And so it's very important to try to determine uh, should driving be limited or discontinued? And I know this is often a very hot button or psychological challenge for families and patients to deal with, but it, it's very, safety has to come first. And it's really the responsibility of the family to follow through with that, those recommendations. If needed, we can inform the Department of Motor Vehicles, but it rarely comes to that. Another thing we can do is test driving uh, safety. The best way to do that is with an occupational therapy driving simulation test, which is done in the occupational therapy department. An on the road test is too easy and even patients with significant dementia can still pass that test. So it's not a good indicator of driving safety. Okay. So where are we with developing new treatments for Alzheimer's disease? I mentioned we have some medications that are approved that provide a mild benefit, but the disease still progresses. What we're trying to do is find treatments that actually modify the course and slow things down and start them as early as possible, as we do with other major diseases. So you probably heard about aducanumab, which now is known as Aduhelm after it was approved by the FDA. And this is a medication that it's an antibody that lowers amyloid plaques. It's a monoclonal antibody. So it's an immune based treatment. It gets into the, it's given intravenously. It gets into the brain at low concentrations. It binds to the plaque, as you see on the right side of this slide. It stimulates immune cells to help break up the plaque and clear it. And you can see here on the left side on the journal Nature on the cover that this is a patient uh, who had a PET scan before treatment and one year later and there was substantial lowering of amyloid plaque. And so we got encouraging results from an early trial of this medicine, which showed substantial dose related plaque reduction. And in that study, a slowing down of cognitive decline. So we were really encouraged by those results. And then two large scale phase three called pivotal or confirmatory trials were done. And they were, they were fully enrolled, but they were stopped a year early. Um, and the determination was made that the study, the drug was unlikely to meet the primary clinical outcomes. This was a very jarring result. That's when half the people had completed the trial at high dose. When all the data was analyzed from the rest of the patients, they found that one of the trials was positive, had met the outcomes, and one was negative. 
This was a controversial uh, outcome because the trial had been interrupted early and the two trials did not agree in the outcome. Um, so there's a, there's a whole class of medicine that lowers amyloid plaques. And the main side effect, people always ask, okay, if, there's a, if there is a mild benefit, that's one study showed and one study didn't. If there is a mild benefit, what's the main side effect? How safe it, is it? And one thing we learned in testing these medicines is that when you lower amyloid plaques, you can get fluid shifts in the brain. And typically these are transient. There are no symptoms associated with it. Uh, but we use, uh, they show up on MRI, these fluid shifts, and we use the MRI to monitor for that, and we adjust the medicine if needed. Symptoms can occur in 25% of cases. Usually these are mild, but a very small number of cases can be, become more serious. This is what this looks like on the MRI scan. So here's someone uh, before treatment with an amyloid lowering antibody, after the first dose, they had the fluid shifts, which you see is these white areas on the right side of the brain. And we held the medicine and then that went away. Uh, and they were able to actually go back on the medicine. And so we know that the dose of the medicine and whether or not they carry the ApoE4 gene increased the risk of this side effect. So this is something really important in clinical practice is learning how to manage this side effect if these drugs move into the clinic. So with aducanumab, there was a great deal of debate about whether or not there was clinical benefit and whether or not it should be made available to patients. There was an advisory panel that was held which recommended that the information was insufficient to recommend approval. The FDA clinical team thought the uh, information was sufficient and they uh, eventually came up with what's called accelerated approval based on its ability to lower amyloid protein and required an additional trial. This was very controversial, got a lot of coverage in the press. And they, the FDA also gave the green light to two other medicines in this class called denanumab and lecanumab to be also be considered for accelerated approval. And denanumab is another antibody that's given, monoclonal antibody, it's given intravenously once a month, and it lowers amyloid protein. And in a smaller phase two trial, uh, it showed substantial lowering of amyloid plaques and a slowing down of memory loss. And so this was viewed, was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, was viewed very positively as showing that drugs uh, in this class can produce some degree, even though mild, some degree of cognitive benefit. And clearly, can show lowering of amyloid plaque. So the Center for Medicare Services or CMS uh, reviewed this data and they determined that uh, drugs like aducanumab that receive accelerated approval uh, could only be covered through uh, a FDA or NIH approved randomized controlled trial. And that uh, future drugs that receive full approval, not accelerated, not conditional approval, uh, would have to be restricted in some way. And so this is currently, on, this policy is being reviewed because you may have heard last week, there was an announcement of an additional trial, a phase three trial of lecanumab, another antibody that lowers plaque buildup, that had positive results. So uh, after 18 months, there was substantial amyloid lowering, a slowing down of cognitive decline, even though it was mild, um, and a little bit lower rate of the aria than this, the fluid shifts that I mentioned, uh, but still some serious cases uh, can occur. So this medicine is now under consideration by the FDA. They'll make a decision by January 6 on accelerated approval for this drug, and this is given intravenously every two weeks. So it needs to be given a little more often than the other two that I mentioned to you. Um, and they'll be, this drug will come under review for full approval uh, later next year. So that's what's happening on the medication side. And so we're really close to having new treatments for Alzheimer's. 
but we still, we need to do better. So it turns out that 40% of the risk for dementia may be modifiable and largely through uh, lifestyle intervention. So we wanna promote brain health as we age. And it turns out that physical exercise, Mediterranean type diet, brain training uh, online, and good heart health can lower the rate of dementia and probably lower the rate of Alzheimer's and improve memory as we age. So this is great. And clearly there's increasing evidence that if we can prevent stroke by having good heart health, we lower the rate of cognitive impairment with aging. So we all wanna be doing that. There was a study done of exercise, uh, Mediterranean diet, brain training, and heart health in Finland called the finger trial, which shows some positive effects on memory in people 60 to 77 who are at risk of dementia after two years. And so the Alzheimer's Association has launched the US pointer trial to try to replicate and expand on that result. And we're conducting a two year trial uh, in people 60 to 79 who are cognitively normal, uh, but who have a family history, have a metabolic problem like hypertension or diabetes or high cholesterol that puts them at, that, at increased risk, don't exercise regularly, don't follow a Mediterranean type diet to see if we can improve memory after two years. And this has given rise to what's called the worldwide finger movement. I'm so excited about this, is that this lifestyle intervention approach is now being adopted in more than 35 countries in six continents. And it's a, it's a worldwide movement and we need this because we wanna do all we can to lower the rate of, to promote brain health and lower the rate of cognitive impairment with aging. Another exciting approach based on the early success with the amyloid lowering medication and the PET scanning to be able to see the buildup of plaques before the memory loss is can we use these medicines earlier? Because remember I said amyloid begins to build up 15 to 20 years before memory loss. So it makes sense. Could we lower that buildup right away or as soon as we detect it? and try to either turn off or slow down the whole process in the brain so the tau doesn't build up and the nerve cells don't start to degenerate. So there are a number of trials going on to test that, and we're hopeful about it, but we need the data to, we need the evidence to prove it. Um, and I'm gonna tell you just about one study called the AHEAD trial. And this is for people who are 55 to 80, who are cognitively normal, functioning normal, test normal on memory tests. But when they come to have a PET scan, we find out that either they're building up a little bit of amyloid just above the cutoff, or they already have a fair amount of amyloid buildup. And we're gonna see if we can give the medicine lecanemab that I just told you about to lower that amyloid buildup and see if we can either delay or stop the, the prospect of memory loss. Now, another great innovation in this trial is we're now using uh, one of these blood tests, the tests for amyloid and tau to see who is likely to have amyloid buildup in the brain. Now, one positive uh, effect of participating in a trial is a lot of people think that they're definitely, they're having memory trouble, their family, they had memory loss in their family, and they think they're destined to get Alzheimer's or they already have it. Well, they come in and they have the blood test or the amyloid PET scan, and they find out they're actually not building up plaques. This is a great example of a study participant who was sure she had Alzheimer's because her mother had it and many other people in her family had Alzheimer's. Uh, and she was having some mild memory difficulty, but when she had the PET scan, she found out she wasn't building up plaques and her husband made this t-shirt for her that said no plaque. And so that's a great relief because the chance of her developing Alzheimer's while she's alive is actually very low. So that was a terrific relief to her. So we really have opened the era of Alzheimer's prevention. And this is really important for all of us to be aware of because we're gonna need a lot of volunteers to really determine what prevention strategies work best. 
Another exciting development, you may have heard about gene editing or gene modification strategies, um, CRISPR, um, antisense oligonucleotides, all kinds of a funny vocabulary. Uh, but we have different ways of manipulating genes to treat major diseases. Um, and we've used that strategy actually to develop the COVID vaccine, the mRNA vaccines. Well, one strategy which we just started to test this week for Alzheimer's is can we give a drug, an antisense oligonucleotide that actually blocks the transformation of pathological tau in the brain and slow down the process of Alzheimer's disease. Now, this is a whole new approach. It has been proven with other diseases, this strategy, but not yet with Alzheimer's. We have to give, in order to get enough into the brain, we have to inject it into the spinal canal so that it permeates up to the brain and we get enough concentration to affect this genetic change and block tra tau transmission. And we're gonna see, we're in very early stage of this. A phase one trial has been conducted. We just started last week a phase two trial, but this is a very exciting strategy, which I hope will be effective for Alzheimer's. So where are we? Well, um, I take heart from HIV. When I was a medical student, we saw our first patients with AIDS. We didn't know what it was, what the cause, what the cause was. We only knew the manifestations were devastating. A lot of neurologic disease, infections in the brain, dementia, early death, and there was no treatment initially available. One drug called AZT got approved. It only had some partial benefit. It had side effects. But the HIV community just insisted that um, better treatments be made available. And now through combination treatment, it is a much more manageable disease. You don't see the neurologic complications hardly at all, and people live a much longer lifespan, much more normal lifespan. So that's, that's based on combination therapies. And I think we're gonna need the same thing of combination treatment for Alzheimer's. It's incumbent on all of us to pursue a healthy lifestyle to keep our heart, our body, our soul, our psyche, and our brain healthy as we age. And there are things we all can do. And we start them as early as we can in life and keep, keep going. For people who are on a pathway with higher risk for Alzheimer's or already have Alzheimer's changes in the brain, and we're going to get better at detecting that over time, we're going to need other strategies. Lower amyloid probably early. Lower tau or block tau. Block inflammation in a positive way. Protect the brain. Promote healthy aging in the brain. And combine these and personalize them depending uh, on what the risks are for that and, and the molecular profile for that individual. So we're in a very exciting time in this whole field of Alzheimer's prevention and treatment. Uh, and if you wanna learn more, uh, here are two uh, links that you can follow and get more information about what's available in Alzheimer's research. Well, I thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to your questions to follow. Well, it's time for questions and answers, and we've received a lot of good questions already. Thank you so much. Uh, let me ask, uh, let me answer the first one, because uh, it's, it's posed very commonly. And it is, is clinical dementia part of normal aging? And this is confusing because dementia uh, is so common with age. But actually, dementia is not part of normal aging. And a large segment of people live to 100 and don't become demented. Um, dementia means that there's memory loss that interferes with day-to-day -day functioning and it doesn't tell the cause. There are scores of causes of memory loss with Alzheimer's being the most common, uh, but head injury, stroke, Parkinson's disease, alcohol, HIV, many things can cause infections, can cause syphilis used to be one of the major causes years ago, uh, can cause dementia, but 
it's not a normal part of aging. Uh, so that's very important to keep in mind. Another uh, common question is, what can a genetic profile tell us? Well, this is going to change over time as we have more genetic testing. But currently, there are two types of tests that um, might be relevant for people interested in learning more about their risk for Alzheimer's or an actual diagnosis if they're having cognitive difficulty. One is for a risk gene, and the most common form of this is called the APOE4 gene. And this is a test that can be done either with a cheek swab or a blood test. It is available commercially through 23andMe, or it can be done in a clinic, in a specialty clinic like ours, where people can find out if they carry this risk, one or two copies of this risk gene or not. We inherit one copy of APOE from each parent. And there are three forms of this gene, of the APOE gene. APOE2, which decreases the risk for Alzheimer's. APOE3, which is sort of neutral and very common. And APOE4, which increases the risk for Alzheimer's. And approximately 25% of people in the United States carry at least one copy of APOE4. So it's pretty common. And if you carry one or two copies of APOE4, it means you're at higher risk for Alzheimer's. It doesn't mean you're going to get it, uh, but the chances are greater. And it also means that if it does occur, if Alzheimer's does occur, it tends to occur a little bit earlier than if you don't carry this gene. If you carry two copies, you have a much higher risk, and that occurs even earlier. So it's informative about your risk for Alzheimer's and also might be used to screen for clinical trials. For example, we did a prevention trial for people who carry either one or two copies of the APOE4 gene. And so we did why we did swab parties uh, and wide testing for this gene. And we found, we've studied the psychology of finding out about risk using APOE4 and other tests as well. And for the people who want to know, who are, want to be proactive and do what they can to uh, lower the chance of developing memory loss due to Alzheimer's, it's very well tolerated uh, psychologically. Uh, but it is important to weigh out what the risks and benefits might be of finding out. The other thing, another genetic test we can do is for a disease-causing mutation. And early onset Alzheimer's is often due to a mutation. This is a, a form of Alzheimer's that begins usually in the late 40s and early 50s and runs in families. And if a mutation is present, the person will develop Alzheimer's and usually at the age that their parent, that others in their family um, have experienced it. It's very uncommon. It's about 1% of all people with Alzheimer's, but in families where there's an early onset uh, pattern in multiple family members, we test for this gene. Usually this is done with a blood test. This is not available over the counter. Well, it actually may be available through some of these over the counter uh, testing programs, uh, genetic testing programs. I don't recommend that you do that because it has really serious implications for you and your family if you were to carry one of these mutations and you really need genetics counseling and also help from uh, neurologists and other experts related to Alzheimer's. But we can test for that. And then other conditions that cause memory loss, such as frontotemporal dementia, also have mutations that can be tested for in families where uh, this appears to run in a family. So those two different types, and they're very different, ones for mutation and ones for a risk gene. Next question is, <laughs> this is a great question. What is the reasoning behind lack of insurance coverage for the scans? Um, it is because, is it because there's a little in the way of treatment if detected? I think the biggest reluctance so far is the potential costs. And I think insurers and especially Medicare are concerned about that. Um, this will 
This type of testing will become increasingly more important as we have treatments to slow the disease process. And we're starting, those are coming into clinical practice. So there were results released just two weeks ago that are encouraging and new medicine that may be approved by the FDA and available in the clinic. And we will need PET scans and spinal fluid tests and blood tests to help screen for that. And hopefully those will be covered along with the treatment. So these, these tests have been available for a number of years, and but they have not been covered, so we haven't used them yet in clinical practice, but I think that's gonna change very soon. Would I recommend that everyone have a PET scan to identify plaques early on before memory loss occurs? I think in general, we want to anticipate and prevent a serious condition like Alzheimer's. Um, and if we have tests like an amyloid PET scan or even better, a blood test to determine that, and we had treatments to actually slow it down or stop the disease process altogether, that would be terrific and have a great impact on public health. Um, so one of the problems with PET scanning it, is it, it's expensive. So we can't, and it's not readily available, especially around the world but even in the, in the United States. So we can't do it routinely at this point. But I think blood tests are gonna be much more economical and more widely available. And those will help us determine who might need an, a PET scan uh, to confirm the presence of Alzheimer changes in the brain. So it's not yet gonna be available for everyone, but just as we screen for cholesterol and hypertension, I can envision a day when we will do much more widespread screening for Alzheimer's for, to detect risk so we can mitigate that risk. Is an occurrence of transient global amnesia associated with the later development of every, any kind of dementia? Well, that's a great question. So transient global amnesia is sort of a dramatic uh, episode where a person um, memory has a an episode of memory failure that usually lasts a couple of hours and they're really confused and repetitive and then it goes away and usually it doesn't come back um, we think the memory area of the brain becomes temporarily dysfunctional um, Occasionally it does recur, but usually it's a single episode. And it's usually not connected to another memory disorder. Um, now, certainly if stroke were the cause of that and a person went on to have another stroke, that's like a TIA, a transient stroke. If they went on to have another stroke, again, that stroke increases the risk of developing memory loss and dementia. But usually transient global amnesia, it's pretty uncommon, though dramatic, uh, but usually it's a single occurrence. Does a HAM -M MRI show amyloid or are the special non-insured tracers required to see amyloid? Um, why is clinical screening for amyloid buildup in the brain not currently available? Okay, so we just answered part of that question. So uh, often people get confused. MRI is currently is really good for seeing the structure of the brain. So we can, we can tell the brain volume and actually if we use a quantitative measurement, we can measure the actual size of the brain and get a readout of that. Um, and we can look in specific areas like the memory area to see if there's been shrinkage there and that may be consistent with Alzheimer changes. But we can also use the MRI to look for hydrocephalus, too much water in the brain we can look for evidence of stroke or hardening of the arteries. We can look for brain tumors, many other things that could be contributing to memory loss. Um, but MRI currently does not show amyloid buildup. It can't image that. Uh, and we do need uh, the brain scans we use for that is a PET scan and special tracers that bind to the amyloid plaques and also to the tau tangles, a different tracer that binds to the tau tangles. Currently, we need a PET scan for that. And those are not yet covered by insurance, but again, hopefully that will change as new treatments become available. You mentioned a TSH analysis 
involved with diagnosing dementia. And that's thyroid stimulating hormone. And the question is, why does that matter? Um, well, it turns out hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism, so permutations in thyroid balance, either too high or too low, can cause significant cognitive impairment if it's profound. If it's mildly off, usually there are no cognitive symptoms. But if it's really low, the person becomes sluggish and almost inert. And if it's too high, they tend to get hyper um, and have other behavioral manifestations. So that's an easy test to do uh, to make sure that thyroid levels are relatively within range and not contributing to memory loss. The same is true for vitamin B12. Uh, a significant deficiency in vitamin B12 uh, can produce significant cognitive impairment. Again, a mild uh, abnormality usually does not cause cognitive impairment, but that's an easy test to do. And usually your primary care doctor or a memory specialist uh, will obtain that as part of the evaluation. Does there seem to be any relationship be between dementia and certain races or different countries of the world? And the answer is yes to that. Uh, there are certain groups, and we don't know all the reasons why, and that's why we need to study a broad group of people to figure this out. But people of color have a higher rate of uh, Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, people from the Hispanic community have a higher rate as well. The, um, the prevalence of the APOE4 gene varies by country, tends to be a little higher in Northern European uh, countries and lower in other parts of the world to, some, to a mild degree. So there are variations um, from uh, among groups and in different parts of the world. And certainly, there are social determinants of health, there are socioeconomic factors that definitely contribute to comorbidities, other conditions that are causing memory loss and overall uh, health and quality of life. Okay, this is a really important question. Um, how can the results of a diagnostic test for these diseases be kept confidential? so they cannot be used by insurance companies to deny coverage or assess higher premiums? That's a really important question. Well, most of these tests currently are done through research unless you do them yourself through over-the-counter test testing. Um, we attempt to the degree possible to keep that uh, in a separate database, not as part of the medical record, and not discoverable by insurance, but that's not a, a foolproof system as we all know. Um, but every attempt is made. Now, as these tests and treatments come into clinical practice, this will be more of an issue. Currently, there are protections in the United States about pre-existing conditions. So if, woman, if someone has a pre-existing con condition, they cannot be denied insurance coverage, health insurance because of that. That does not necessarily apply to life insurance or long-term care insurance. Where I don't think at this point, companies have been factoring in APOE testing because it's been so infrequent um, or other type of testing for memory loss, but that could change. And so this may be an issue for those other forms of insurance to try to protect patients, people, and make sure they get the coverage that they need. Does the US government help fund research? Uh, yes, and I showed a graph about that in one of the earliest slides. There's been a dramatic growth in funding from the NIH, over $3 billion a year now for Alzheimer's research, which has been terrific um, and the, has really spurred advances in you know, many of which I spoke to you about today. So. The government is playing a really key role around governments around the world, but especially in the United States. And there are new alliances forming through the World Health Organization, the World Dementia Council, uh, the Davos Alzheimer's Initiative, so many different initiatives to really spur innovation, which we all need. I'd love to keep going. These are great questions. Uh, and I'm definitely not going to be able to get through uh, all of them. Maybe I'll just finish with one uh, last question, which is sort of neat, is about muscle memory, like piano playing. 
uh, is the last to go. And it turns out that there are different, I didn't get a chance to go into this in this today's lecture, but it's really fascinating in terms of cognitive neuroscience, that there are different memory systems in the brain. So what tends to go early in Alzheimer's is what's called episodic memory. That's remembering details of something we've just learned. So encoding new information and keeping track of it. But there are other forms of memory that we learn by rote um, repetition, like riding a bicycle or playing a piano. And playing a piano, if you practice for many years, it's overlearned. And the motor ability is preserved. And actually, the music, uh, the musical library is preserved for many years. And so there are many patients with Alzheimer's that can play a full concert and can still read music. And some can still learn to read new pieces, which is amazing, even though they can't remember what they just had to eat or people's names or anything about their day-to-day -day life of recent memory. Those old memories are preserved because those systems are the brain are affected later in Alzheimer's. They don't break down. They're so well developed. So education can help protect us. Keep taking lectures through one day university because uh, keep your brain stimulated because those connections, those synapses really need that stimulation. And that provides protection. Those are the last to break down. It's the new information that's more vulnerable. Well, that's all we have time for today. Thank you so much for listening. It's such an important topic and I appreciate all of your questions. And uh, I hope I get to contact some of you in, the, in person uh, as time goes by.